Hi, I'm Tony Dolliger, Managing Director at Analytics 8. There's five major areas we recommend clients focus on when trying to optimize their spend on data analytics, technology, services, and talent to balance and get uh, both uh, a price and performance outcomes that they want. Today, I'm going to address one of those five areas that's focused on contractors, consultants, and managed service providers. I get it. I'm a consultant. You might think that me talking to you about how to optimize your talent strategy is like a fox in the hen house, maybe. Uh, but stay with me, though. Uh, I've seen dozens of talent strategies that our clients have employed to deliver data analytics capabilities to their organizations. Yes, my perspective is biased to organizations who employ consultants or contractors at some level. But when they do employ a talent strategy with more than just full-time staff that include consultants, there's a ton of pitfalls that people slip into that I've seen. My goal today is to help you think about uh, how you can think about different consultancies, contractors, or temp agencies so that you can right-size your data analytics spend in that area. It's painfully obvious to me that not all consultancies are equal, even when they look like they operate in similar market segments, similar capabilities, similar customers, similar talent. Still, there's big differences uh, between who you can engage with. Uh, and so I'd like to help provide a framework to you uh, in a way to think about your service providers. So when a company uh, has their thinking off in this area, they either over or under spend in ways that either can blow their budget without creating commensurate value, or people try to save money uh, in ways that actually end up creating more pain and suffering from a lack of quality or maturity in their organization. <clears throat> so here's a few things to kind of keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about how to build out a talent strategy that includes consultants, contractors, or managed service providers. First thing is pay people to do strategy work who can prove to you they've actually been part of successful implementations of those strategies, uh, particularly with quick time to seeing value of those strategies. No, they don't necessarily need to be implementers, although I could argue the value of, of that too in, in strategy providers. But uh, I see slide decks for data strategies that make no sense. Uh, they have an extremely long timeline to actually realizing value. They assume months or years before something actually gets into the hands of real humans. Um, their measurable outcomes sound more like a list of technologies rather than business benefits realized. So best way to avoid that pitfall is to ask for references of consultancies who are going to be doing data strategy work from you and really ask those references about their expectations going in versus the reality of what was actually realized from that strategic outcome and that, that strategic engagement. The second pitfall don't move roles and resources offshore when there's a dependency on synchronous communication between teams. Global teams are fantastic. We love our global teams and they kick butt all the time for our clients. But when teams are not time zone aligned when they should be, and when the work is not well defined or able to be completed asynchronously, all sorts of time delays and risks are put into projects. Not everyone is set up for success with that, right? Um, there's also such a thing as opportunity cost, right? In, in data analytics, information is valuable for just a certain period of time. So if you build your teams to deliver analytics solutions with built-in delays in communication, you create risk that that information no longer is valuable. So be mindful of that. Design global team models around work that can be done asynchronously and align teams to time zones uh, where collaboration and communication is key to success. Third area is that uh, I see companies uh, selecting uh, consultants and contractors for implementation teams, basically based on the skills they provide um, for the individuals they're hiring for the job. Uh, that sounds like a good path, right? But the problem in that, uh, like skills are, are important, of course. But I'd argue like the real differentiators that you're going to have in contracted service providers is not whether or not somebody knows a programming language sufficiently well, because um, there's that's a dime a dozen, but rather the processes and frameworks that they can bring to the table, in addition to the skills that they have. So like at NLX8, for example, we have methodologies and processes that have worked for our clients for two decades that we bring to the table, in addition to just like our raw skills of our individual consultants. Others have that too. Um, um, that is what that is better than just having individuals, right? Um, but another benefit you can kind of contemplate uh, with a consultancy is also the culture of that consultancy. So like we have a culture in LX8 built around 
our consultants helping other consultants that are their peers. So that means when you work with us, right, you actually have a built-in network of consultants that our teams can talk to when they get stuck or have questions. When you hire one person, you get one person. When you hire a consultancy, you should get the benefit of that whole organization's knowledge on your project. And really what you need to do for this, right, is determine if the work that you're having to be done demands a person to do a well-defined thing, or if it's ambiguous enough um, or, or procedural, right? You wanna try to benefit from outside help that's gonna benefit from multiple perspectives of experience rather than just an individual, right? And when you just hire for a skill or a programming language or a person, right? You're missing out on the framework that can be given there from the perspective of experience of actually helping to implement a process for you to help solve problems ongoingly outside of just that one person's skill set. Finally, consultancies will tell you ultimately what it'll be like to work with them based on how they treat you in the sales process. So my last point is just pay attention in the sales process. Like, who do you get to talk to from that organization? Do they put actual consultants in front of you or do they hide them away in a corner for the people that you're actually gonna be working with because they don't wanna put them in front of you? in the sales process to expose like what it's like to work with their real teams. How responsive are the teams? They get back to you right away with simple questions or they at least tell you like, hey, I'm working on this and then get back to you by the time they said they're gonna get back to you. Do they listen to you and repeat back what they heard you say accurately? Did the proposal they give you match what you actually asked for? Uh, were their estimating uh, models and costs as clear to you as they can be? Like, do you understand what you're paying for and what you're getting? Do they explain to you what life would look like after employing their services and engagements over? Or do they just assume they'd be with you unwantedly in perpetuity, right? Did they seem interested in the business benefit of what you're asking them to build, design, or create? Or do they just seem like they want to work on a project for you? Um, ultimately, how you are treated during a sales process is a not so subtle indicator of what your consultants are going to behave like during the engagement too. So pay attention there and avoid the dreaded second pass at having to hire a new team of consultants along the way. Follow Analytics 8 to hear more tips like this and insights about the data analytics industry as a whole.